Banking from the day one was a corrupt business. And so it evolved to be more and more corrupt. But there were some brief periods, as you know, you've read my book, where miraculously the banks didn't try and, and cheat and steal and deceive. Banking should perform in that fashion. If it did, I'd be all for it. So the solution is to go back to honest banking and get rid of all the laws that give banks special privileges to lie, cheat, and steal. This is Little by Little with Andy Schechtman. Everyone, thank you for for being here for episode number two of Little by Little with Andy Schechtman, and I could not be more thrilled and honored to have with me the author and creature from Jekyll Island, a book that has meant so much to me and my family. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, G. Edward Griffin. And uh, Mr. Griffin, thank you so much for honoring me with your presence. You are uh, someone who has meant a lot to me, um, more so than you know. Um, many years ago, uh, in, I don't even remember, 20 years ago, we used to write a newsletter at Miles Franklin, and we would write what started out as a quarterly newsletter, a newsletter morphed into a monthly newsletter, morphed into a weekly, mo morphed into a daily. And one of the ways that we would attract people would be to offer them incentives, whatever it would be, to sign up for our newsletter. One such incentive was we bought I don't know how many dozens of your books and said, sign up for our newsletter and receive a free copy of The Creature from Jekyll Island. I read the book 20 plus years ago and and a profound impact on me it certainly made so much so that my son who now works at miles franklin uh, after four years of of being a, a cpa with price waterhouse when he was a senior in high school did his senior report in economics class on your book and his teacher said to him, well, Josh, I have to tell you, you're the first student I've ever had where I had to tell him that his report was actually too long. So your your <laughs> book uh, has a lot of meaning to myself, my father, to my son, uh, and I'm sure to numerous people out there. And so I just wanted to thank you for being here. I couldn't think of a better first guest, uh, which you are, to have on my show than you. And uh, so thank you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart from being here. And it's an honor to chat with you. And well, how are you doing, by the way? <laughs> well, I'm doing great, Andy. And thank you for that <laughs> kind remark in the opening. As I've said many times, it's sometimes you wonder, why are you working your fool head off? I never thought anybody would want to read a 600 page book on banking and money. Well, money, of course, making money, but People want to know how they make the money, not how the bankers make the money. Anyway, I was just totally amazed when the book took off and everybody wanted to read it and, and give away copies like you did. So my thanks to you for that. Absolutely. And I got to be honest with you, I, you know, as a young kid thinking, I do I really want to read a 600 page book on banking? No, until I started <laughs> reading it. And then I'm like, my gosh, I mean just learning things such as the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor a reserve, learning the truth. Which leads me to my first question, and that would be, what inspired you, Edward, to start questioning the mainstream narratives and writing about these topics? And, you know, this book was written, what year did you write this book? This book was written in, what, 19, uh, 1997? Does that sound right? It's not 96, I think, or maybe 97. Is it long, a long time ago. <laughs> So what what did it what what inspired you to start going down this rabbit hole and how did you find all of this information that you've so eloquently put into into words? Well, it's a it's a dull story actually, so I'll have to make it short. I wish I could interlace it with a make it sound like a James Bond adventure or something like that, but uh, no, there were there were there was no. Uh, um, bad guy, I mean, big bad guys are looming in the background, and there were no um, pretty girls uh, trying to lure me and, and down the wrong path. That came after. Like that. <laughs> yeah, it was a boring journey in a way. But it all started uh, when I decided to quit my corporate job. And um, I was on, you know, like a lot of young guys, I was, I had a new family, had a brand new wife, and had a kid, a little kid, a baby in the basket and one on the way and all of a sudden I looked in the mirror one morning and said oh my gosh Edward you've got a 
you've got a responsibility here and uh, you better start providing for your family. So I started thinking about things outside of myself for the first time, probably. It was all about how am I looking, how, am I, how much money am I making, and uh, you know, I have the best car I could get, maybe a nicer house or something. It was all materialistic, materialistic things, and I decided I had to get serious about providing for a family. So I went to work for a large insurance company, and then I discovered what was going on in the world, sort of accidentally, and uh, I decided that I had, oh, I surprised myself, I should say, because I, dis I discovered that I had a crusader gene that started to vibrate. And I, uh, for the first time in my life, I decided to think, I've got to do something about this world condition, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like crusader rabbit. <laughs> and uh, so I, the, more I, the more I read, the more I discovered that the things were really not at all like I thought they were. You know, I was born into a beautiful system. I didn't realize it was the tail end of the remnants of a great, of a great uh, nation based on the principles of individual liberty and, and um, government was there to serve you, not to control you and all that. I didn't realize that was the tail end of it. I thought I was just right in the middle of it and it would all be lasting forever. But when I discovered that there were very strong forces at work behind the scenes who were already nibbling away, seriously nibbling away on the foundations of all of our American way of life and our liberties and our freedoms and our privacy and all these other things. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I didn't know this. So I decided I had to do something about it and I quit my job at the corporate oh. world and decided to go into doing battle against all the evil in the world somehow by myself. And um, now that was the beginning of this story. So what do I do to, to um, make a living? My poor wife, she, I told her I was going to quit my job. <laughs> she says, what? What? what are we going to, how are we going to put food on the table? And, uh, and typically I said, oh, I don't know. We'll figure it out somehow. I'm very cavalier about the whole thing. But eventually that became a problem. So I was really okay. trained only to do one thing in school. Uh, I mean, I went to the university, of course. I had, I was fortunate to get a scholarship that paid most of the bills. And I, I had a couple of jobs while I was going to school so I could work my way through school. I came from a very, a very middle class family and it was been very difficult to go to college and pay for it. So I was fortunate I had these scholarships and, um, and these jobs. But um, what did I take? I didn't go to school to learn anything. I went to have some fun like most kids do. And I had a lot of fun. But fortunately, I, you know, I took easy courses. <laughs> I thought, oh, I have to, excuse me, I do a lot of digression. But when I say easy courses, I was thinking one of the big mistakes. I thought, here's one of the lists I'm going to take. It's got to be easy. It's called astronomy. I'm going to take astronomy. I said, what, you're looking at the stars. Well, that's got to be easy. Well, it was one of the toughest courses I ever took. <laughs> I almost flunked that one out. That was bad judgment on my part. But uh, most of them were, you know, soft courses. And I, I went into drama and communications, and I decided I was going to go into the television business and, and become a television producer. So those are the kinds of courses I took, and uh, I was good at them. And and fortunately, I got my grades were good. But had I been enrolled in a real serious scholarly and, uh, curriculum, I don't think I would have done too well. So all I, okay, the bottom line is I was trained uh, how to work in television. I had been actually as a kid, I was actually a child actor, if you can believe that. So I was familiar with the entertainment field and how, how the cameras worked. And I, I went, I got a job as an assistant television director at, at a television station back in the days when that was all brand new. It was WWJ TV in Detroit. And so I did all of that. So I went in the military and when I came out, now I go back into the, into the entertainment field, I thought. Went to Hollywood. And I discovered that there were a lot of people there, young guys and gals, with much better talent than mine. And they were wasting their lives, waiting table and, and uh, you know, and washing cars. Shot. 
waiting for the big, uh, big opportunity. And I decided that wasn't for me. That's when I went to work for the corporate corporation. But then I, I discovered the, that the world was going to hell in a handbasket. So I gave all that up. So what do I do? Well, I will go back to what I thought I knew, which was uh, communications. And um, I decided that I would start to produce a series of very low budget, believe me, very low budget documentary films. And that's uh, perhaps an a grandizing phrase because they were actually just a series of still pictures that you shine up on a screen. Back in those days they called them film strips and uh, you had a roll of 35 millimeter film and you have narration on a big platter like a recording, you know, 78 RPM recording. You put that and the, the soundtrack goes through the PA system and then whenever you want to change a picture uh, the sound goes beep <laughs> and the operator turns the knob to the next frame, still frame, which is projected up on the screen. That, those were our documentary films in those days. Very low budget stuff. So I, I, was, I did that. I, I was producing those on what I could afford to do. And I was able to put food on the table, but not much more. But uh, the process, of course, led me down the path of, well, what is my next film going to be? What's my next topic going to be? Well, I decided that I wanted to do one on inflation. What was the cause of inflation? Well, we got inflation today. It's grocery Back store in, owners, didn't you know that? Greedy grocery store owners. They're, that's yeah, the, the greedy grocery stores. <laughs> and of course, that was part of the film. We talked about those greedy grocery stores. <laughs> so we talked to the greedy farmers and they said, no, no, it was those unions. So we talked to the greedy union guys and said, no, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something else. It was always the pointing to the other guy. And I was getting the picture that uh, we weren't even close to the topic. And I ran across something that suggested that maybe the creation of money might have something to do with, with it. If you create too much money, if you start producing more money than other people are producing goods and services, then you flood the world with money and it becomes worthless. I got, oh, I get the picture, but now I wanted to do a film on it and be an expert. So I started to gather serious research on the topic and it rapidly became way too big for me. I didn't realize, I didn't realize what the Federal Reserve System was. I, I thought it was the government agency like most other people. I didn't realize that it was a banking cartel. <laughs> but by the time I started to put all this information together in the, in the research phase, I wound up with a couple of banker boxes full of books and papers and reports and magazine articles and, and recordings of phone conversations, all that. And I had to put it aside because it grew, it was too big for me. And I had to get a, a simpler documentary out so I could sell it and keep those groceries on the table. So I parked the books away, I mean the boxes away. And I don't know, it was like probably a year later or so, I got a call from a, a lady in Pasadena. We've all heard the story about the little old ladies in Pasadena. Well, yeah. this was, this was one. Sure, her husband had passed away, he'd been very, very successful there. She's got a beautiful home in Pasadena, a brand new car of about 10 years previously. I don't think she ever drove it. It was, a, you know, it was 10 years old, had like 200 miles on the car. And, uh, but what she did is she had a study group and she was very concerned as I was with what was going on in the world. And she had uh, a study group, which she had focused on taxes. So every, every month she had a meeting on taxation and, and how the tax system that we had was, uh, was wrong, evil and unproductive and destructive and all, all the unconstitutional, all these good statements. And she wanted me to speak about taxes. And I was giving speeches, of course, at this time. Uh, I wasn't charging for them because nobody wanted to pay for a young kid like me to give a speech and pay for it, you know, and what, what would I know? But I was hoping to build a reputation. So I said, well, I don't know anything about taxes um, except that they're too high and I'm again them. What else can you say? But I tell you what, I could talk to you about a hidden tax if you wanted. And she said, oh, a hidden tax. What is that? Of course, I'm thinking of inflation in my mind and I... I said, well, I tell you what, you just have to retain my services and in order to find out what this hidden tax is, it's much bigger than all the taxes you've been talking about. 
She says, okay, you win. So she booked me in for the speech. I'm taking too long to answer this, but... No, it's, it's fantastic. Please continue. <laughs> these, are, these are the thoughts that flood through my mind. Uh, nothing was planned, you understand. These things, all these things are just, they're like trees falling across your path. So I got out my banker boxes and uh, started thumbing through them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't realize really how big and monstrous this whole Federal Reserve System was until the second time through this material to get the speech prepared. And so uh, I got really into it the second time through and cobbled together a, an outline and I gave this presentation and it was a, a big success. Uh, the people that were there, there were about I think 60 or 70 people, a lot of them encouraged me to say, that's really interesting, Ed, you ought to put that on the road. Well, put it on the road was an interesting idea, so I did. <laughs> I, I whipped it together and called it a, a one-day seminar a crash course on money. And, uh, and we traveled all around the country. It was a, it was a road tour. And um, by the time I got, you know, deeply into that, I was getting, learning a lot. You know, they say you don't really learn something until you try and teach it or explain it. It's certainly true in these I cases. I agree with that. Yeah. And so here I was trying to explain something very difficult. And by the time I got to the fifth or sixth presentation, I was beginning to understand it myself. <laughs> no, I get that. I, I understand that. When I talk about the same stuff on all the podcasts I'll do over a course of a week, by the end of the week, I know it cold. I get it. Yeah, yeah that, you know, that's get true. It. You start sure. to even learn things yourself. And, you know, some of the things that, that you've talked about, the hidden tax of inflation. And it's just amazing to me that this was done, you were doing this 40, 50 years ago, um, and we haven't learned from anything from where we are now when we're still being told it's the greedy grocery store owners and the greedy, the greedy business owners that are creating inflation where all we had to do is realize, listen to you or listen to any Austrian economist who will tell you that every single time it is an increase in the money supply. And... Yet we're so far diverged from from reality. Here we are, all these years later, and and your message still uh, is is while so very very important is still so foreign to so many people. And and that to me is one of the most shocking things about your journey from where you started to where you are now. You would think that something as important as this would be taught in every school, in every high school in the country, to understand that the origins of money, the origins of, of, of monetary policy and, and, and how it affects us day by day. You, someone who who underscores the the old statement, uh, you know, invention is 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 the mother of necessity. I mean, you certainly did that, and you did all of this before the internet, where you were able to to research, and which 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 brings me to a question. And you know, how did you go about conducting research and dealing with these topics when you didn't have a central go to place like like the internet? Where did you come up with all of this information? Which is amazing. If if anyone hasn't read this book. You really need to, and it will open your eyes to a degree that you can't really explain in, in a in a 30, 40 minute podcast. But for my own edification, where did you find all of this information? How'd you go about conducting your research? Well, I think the um, the obvious answer, uh, somewhat humorous and somewhat embarrassing, is that I stole it from other researchers. That's what everybody does. <laughs> That's what everybody does. I've stolen yeah, plenty but, of yours, I must say, and, and <laughs> but I always give you credit. <laughs> well, if you, you, you give credit, of course, but still, the old saying, we stand on the shoulders of giants, is certainly true. There were quite a few books already written on the topic of money and banking. Most of them, I must say, were pretty boring because they were <laughs> focused on money and banking. Right. <laughs> but when I saw the topic, I saw it differently. I saw it through the lens of a, of a storyteller. And I saw this as a story like a whodunit. It was a great crime, the greatest heist of history, when people 
pretend to be the government and aren't even the government, but they pretend to be it, mm. and they get away with it, Good and one. they get the legal right to create the nation's money supply, and they get the, the right to create as much of it as they wish without any oversight on the part of the government that gave them that power. And I realized putting all these things together, this, this was the crime of all history. So I wrote, I tried to write the, the story as it was a whodunit. And so when I discovered who did it and how they did it and uh, how they tried to cover it up and, and um, put the blame on some innocent party, I got the idea this is how I should pursue the story. And when you do it that way, it, it comes to life. It's the real story. It's not just, how, you know, uh, how many members are on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve System, you know, and how many votes do they get? And it's not, it's not th those kinds of questions at all. Uh, it, it's a question of uh, ethics. It's the question of deception and plunder. And it's, it's drama. So I saw it that way. I tried to write it that way. And I think that's the reason that the book sort of singled itself away from all of the, the dull brothers and sisters that had led up to it. But, but yeah, you start off book. by reading the book. It's long, but it's not boring. And I would agree with you. It's, it's, you start it's, off with it's, writing. Writing up, write, it should be a movie. Well, it should, yeah. Uh, but several movies, actually, because they're stories within stories. You know, J Just the, the sinking of the Lusitania alone is a, is a story. And uh, in fact, it's been told, but not from a financial side. Anyway, that's it. Uh, how did I do it? Well, I started by reading the books that were already written, and I decided I would take those facts, and I had to check them out, by the way, because although the, most of them were really quite scholarly, some of them were more, um, let's say, flexible in their telling of the historical facts. They would uh, embellish them a little bit. And, um, and when I went back to the original sources to check them out, I found out that, well, they weren't quite as dramatic as they was when I read it. But the essence of the story was correct. So a lot of my job was to clean out the, the uh, imaginary stuff. The, in other words, these people were trying to make a movie out of it that would be a, a, popular in the theaters. So they add a little sex to it or a little, uh, you know, a little violence or whatever they think they have to do. So I got rid of all of that stuff and just stuck with the actual historical record. And knowing in advance, uh, Andy, that what I was writing, I already discovered, was going to be terribly unpopular mm -hmm. uh, with the mainstream media. Most people are open to it, but they've been conditioned, as I was, to just think that oh, this whole story was just so absurd. It had to be conspiracy theory or something like that. So I knew that I would be up against that. So I was, I went out of my way to meticulously document every little thing that I put in the book. And I tried my best to take information only from the players themselves, not from previous authors who were talk, talking about their opinions of what was going on. I, I wanted to find what the, what the men who did these things thought about it. So uh, that's why you find so bloody many footnotes in my books just in my, for, to defend myself against the, the college professors that would come after me and say, well, that's, you got that all wrong. You, you should go to school and learn about something before you, you try and write about it, you know. <laughs> and uh, That doesn't surprise me at all, which I guess would lead me to one question, uh, and that is, you know, for, for people who haven't read your book, in a nutshell, what would be the most surprising discovery that you made regarding the Federal Reserve? If there was one. Well, there's one, but with two components to it. I'll, I'll give you the components. The first discovery was that the Federal Reserve was created under conditions of extreme secrecy. Extreme. I mean, very few wars of history have ever been planned and launched under conditions of more secrecy than the Federal Reserve System. So that was kind of a shock because I, even I, could, in my early stages of ignorance, could figure out that normally when you try and hide something or when you do something in secret, you're trying to hide something. So I was curious as to what it was that they were trying to hide. So that's the first part. The second part is a continuation is, well, what were they trying to hide? They were trying to hide that they were taking over the world, using money as the 
as the mechanism, the tool by which they accomplished that goal. And they were trying to hide the fact that their, their goal was, and now uh, is, has been achieved, and this is perhaps the most shocking part to most people, is that we are led to believe that the government regulates the Federal Reserve System, and we have control over it. But in truth, the Federal Reserve System regulates the government and has control over it. The Federal Reserve System and the monetary forces that they represent are actually the ruling powers of our society and our government and not the people we elect for Congress and the Senate. And the I president. believe that in my heart, you look at our current administration and it becomes much easier to understand that. It's much easier to see it today, yes. So do you, oh, but, would you say- But it has been that way, the point I wanna make. Now I realize it was that way when I was born and I didn't realize it. Would you say that this still represents the most significant economic threat facing the world today? I mean, is there anything good that can come of this or is this something that ultimately is, is a big threat? To, to, to society. The creation of money uh, based, w based on just the power of decree, in other words, fiat money, it is the existential threat to the world because that's the method by which a very few number of people who have great economic power can simply purchase political power. Right. They can purchase uh, communications power they can purchase military power. They can purchase everything because they make money. They make it, literally, create the bloody stuff. And determine, now they're going to determine who even has any of it. Not just who, how much you get and how much you know, special uh, uh, attention you get in tax deductions and so forth. They're going to determine whether you have any money of your own now, any of it. So that's gone all to the extreme. So there's my answer to your question. The, the real most shocking thing is to find out that the world in which we live is, is not led by governments, but led by banks. Agree. And which would lead me to the question, you know, we, we've been inundated with, with these current globalist movements like the WEF, the World Economic Forum, uh, the Great Reset, you'll own nothing and be happy. In your opinion, is this an extension of the ideas that you've warned about for the past 40 plus years, 50 years? Is this is this the culmination of everything that you saw coming to fruition? Absolutely. It is it. it. This is it. I never quite envisioned what it would look like. I thought it would be a little bit more familiar looking to the exist or the previous system, but they're, they're going to overmake the whole thing from ground up. There won't even be money, you know, it's, it'll be credits as be central bank digital currency tokens and things like that. And it's not even money because we, it's not ours. We can't own it. We'll be allowed to use it if, as long as we obey. But if we step out of line, we, we won't even be able to sit in the corner with a tin cup asking for donations because there will be no coins to put in the cup. There will be no money. It's all digital. Understood. So and and I've, I, I have often wondered myself the pushback. Do you think that the, the rise of cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance will butt heads with centralized financial institutions? In, in other words, do you think that the concept of decentralization of, of, of money is it's a neat idea, but one that will not be allowed to express itself in the end, if you had to guess. Yes, precisely. It's a great idea. And I think that's its total merit. It's an idea. <laughs> but I don't think it was ever, whoever created this thing, I don't know if it was Natoshi or whatever his name is, I suspect it was done by government agencies and probably several of them with many, many brilliant minds working on it. If you, if you look at those reports that came out in the beginning, the white paper, yep. it sounds, uh, it sounds like a committee. It was put together by a committee, not by one man. You can just tell the way it's written. So I think it's probably not, I, I can't prove this. I talked about the importance of documenting things. I cannot document this. So I'll label it strictly my opinion or my suspicion that it was probably planned, uh, in the beginning, but in order to sell the idea, such a novel idea on the unsuspecting public, you have to have some pretty good slogans or some qualities that make it popular or attractive. And one of the best ways to sell um, a new monetary system 
is to convince people that it's going to replace all the ills and the and the chicanery and the corruption of the old monetary system. We'll have um, well, this will be private. It'll be peer to peer and all that stuff. Oh yeah, let's go for it. And so we get using it, and some people became very wealthy using it and so forth. And but all along, it's had a back door. They, I think they knew, maybe not precisely how they could control it, but I think they were pretty, con pretty sure that inevitably the power of computers would get stronger and stronger. Supercomputers would be, the ones we used to call supercomputers would look like toys compared to what they're now actually using today. And they can crack any of this privacy stuff that they talk about. Yeah, Probably. I wonder about that with, with um, quantum computing. Can they yeah, start to it, crack these algorithms that are supposedly uncrackable? Well, and, and AI, don't forget that. Well, That's and AI, I, exactly. I, I agree with everything you're saying. You're a brilliant man, and I, and I like the way that, you know, the difference... I always say to my son, I say, you know, you're smarter than me, but uh, but um, I'm a whole hell of a lot wiser than you. And, and wisdom comes <laughs> yeah. with gray hair and experience. And you've seen the evolution of this. And and from that lens, is there even a viable alternative to the current central bank system? And if so, in your mind's eye, if there is, what does it even look like? Because I agree with you, decentralization will never be allowed to 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 um, expand and and to assert itself uh, unless by some freak of nature, if the powers that be have anything to do with it, anyways. So, is there an alternative to the current central banking system? Are we in the the midst of moving in that direction, or is that too too broad of a question to even entertain? Well, uh, the broad question doesn't stop me at all because I'm used to dealing with those. <laughs> These are all big issues we we're talking about and uh, you can you can be <clears throat> faithful to the truth and say well I don't really know but the rest of it is what do you think about it because there are certain things you begin to to sense you know your experience uh, your, your, you pick up clues and you, they're, sub, they're subliminal clues and you think uh uh I don't, I don't like the look in this person's eye I've seen this before mm -hmm. and I I don't trust this person. You don't know why, but you've just, yep, you just, I agree. Stuff. yeah. So th those things are worth something, but you have to be careful and not to assume automatically that you're 100% correct. As long as you, you know, have a little uh, hum humility about your, your wisdom, uh, you can say, well, I, I am wiser now than I was uh, 50 years ago. So w w now your question has the, the flavor of well, what do I, do I think is going to happen? And I don't think that um, when we say, what is the alternative to the existing banking system? Um, I don't think we, we even are, are considering all the alternatives. This is like the old idea that they control the political debates, you know. Uh, should, we, should we increase the, uh, the budget by 100%? or 150 percent that's the debate area nobody questions whether we should increase the budget or even decrease it it's just how much would be prudent to increase it you know or should we take out this section of the bill and let it go without that section or should we add another we never question whether the bill itself should be demolished we always we're questioning to what extent shall we move forward seems to me that's the problem in and of itself yeah, that is the, and we're conditioned to that. We don't even question it. You know, who are you going to vote for, Republican or Democrat? What? Is that the only choice? Well, it is if we if we accept what they tell us, you know. Well, I'll and, tell you, uh, living in Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, people will laugh at me for saying this. He was the best politician I ever had. He was a third-party politician, uh, and he gave back money. That was a surplus in the state of Minnesota. I thought he was fantastic, but you're right. I mean, he was laughed at by most people around the country who didn't live underneath um, his ideas, even even making it so that the, the license tabs that you would buy didn't cost you but just a few dollars, not a percentage of the vehicle's cost. Or all sorts of things that made a great amount of sense. I'd vote for him again in a heartbeat. Now, I know most people would think that's crazy, but you're very right. I think that is just it. It's what is the 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 alternative the choices we have what is the one what is the choice that is the least painful but doesn't really address the question and what is the yeah. alternative and exactly. so I, I agree with you i don't know that there is an alternative you know i look at 
Well, may, may I interrupt just a second? Yes, please. I, uh, the rest of my statement is that I think there is an alternative. Oh. And that is to go back to honest banking. It's a, it's a simple thing. It's so simple, like, like it's a... It's a 400-pound gorilla in, the, in this room. You can't see it because it's, it's everywhere. Honest banking, I, I'm not against banking, by the way. I think banking in its true form, if we were conducted like any other business where there, you were required to be honest and, and uh, keep your promises, your contracts, and, and um, you can't steal even though you have a law that makes it legal to steal. You still Does can't that steal. Does that mean a gold-based monetary system? Is that well, what you whatever. mean by yeah, that but, mean a gold-backed I'll back system? Yeah, that in a minute uh, and uh, so forth. But banking, if it served its proper function like it did in a long time ago in a few places in the Netherlands, but, but banking from the day one was a corrupt business. And so it evolved to be more and more corrupt. But there were some brief periods, as you know, you've read my book, where miraculously the banks didn't try and, and cheat and steal and deceive. And it, it wasn't as profitable, of course, as it is today, but it performed a valuable service. And primarily, the bankers would take in all these different gold and silver coins and examine them and grade them and then put them back into commerce and it was a very good service you could trust you could trust the banks based on their experience not based upon their advertising but on their actual experience and so some of the banks prospered because people were willing to pay for the service of protecting their money and grading it as you know the story so banking you know can monetize things you you want to you want to borrow some money to plant crops and you you don't have any money to do it, so but you do have maybe a tractor or something, and you can say, well, I'm so confident that I can use my tractor to grow crops and make enough money to pay on the loan that I'll, I'll put a hawk on my tractor. Well, now what the bank has done is actually a service. They've taken the tractor and monetized it, and they said, if you cannot you know, he can't repay the low, we, we get the tractor and so forth. So then the bank turned around and issued um, not government money, but banknotes. And people were willing or unwilling to accept those banknotes in commerce, depending on the reputation of the bank. <laughs> if, if the bank has a reputation of always uh, uh, messing up or, or not keeping its promises, nobody would accept the, the, um, the banknotes. But those few banks that were honest, they had a good reputation, and people were willing to accept the banknotes. And so the banks c performed a, a service of monetizing physical assets that one an individual couldn't do on their own because they couldn't guarantee success. Uh, where a bank could say, well, we've looked at the tractor, we've looked at the guy, and we're willing to put up our own, our own gold and our own silver to make good on it, even if this guy fails. So anyway... Banking should perform in that fashion. If it did, I'd be all for it. So the solution is to go back to honest banking and get rid of all the laws that give banks special privileges to lie, cheat, and steal. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, Judy Shelton, if Trump were to be elected, I think has a, a high probability, there is a high probability of, of her being the head of the Federal Reserve. And I wonder if someone like Judy Shelton, who is an advocate of the gold standard, would also help inject honesty into a system that that is lacking. I mean, for despite, you know, contrary to to myths, mostly based on ignorance, the uh, gold based based system worked for 180 years in this country with the greatest uh, amount of long term economic growth in human history and no inflation, shockingly enough. So I, I wonder if maybe that thrown into honest banking, we put honest money behind it. And that's something that uh, that would would help foment that that idea and that system. Do you agree that one without the other is not honest? In other words, gold is what is used to keep the bankers honest. Uh, or can you have a system that is honest that is is not based upon something like real money, like gold and silver? In other words, if the Federal Reserve has the right to continue to create money unabated, do we ever get back to to anything that is a semblance of honesty? Well, yeah, I'm glad you rephrased it because the answer to the question comes at the tail end of the, of the question. As long as it has the option of being crooked, 
it will be crooked. Mm-hmm. Now, how old do you have to live to understand this is this is the lesson of history. If if it if if a condition exists where criminality can let's, let's rephrase if you can develop technology that can be used for good or evil, guess which it'll be used for. Mm-hmm. No, a, I little bit of, a little bit of good, but a great deal of evil. Always, yep. always, always. How many times do we have to learn that lesson? So when you ask the question, if, if, the, if the system allows for cheating, stealing, and so forth, it will produce cheating and stealing and so forth. It always will, because that's the, the temptation is too great. So the answer to the question is not do we have a, a system that de- mandates that gold or silver be backing of our currency because this is well to me anyway this is contrary to the principles that i've i've learned to uh, to respect and that's freedom of choice i don't want i think gold and silver should be the backing of currency but i don't want to force people to do it if they disagree with me if they want to accept a banknote or if they want to accept an iou from their neighbor as money and exchange it around Fine, I believe in liberty. Let them do it. It's a risk, and probably the interest rates would be higher and so forth. But I don't believe in using coercion even to promote the ideas that I uh, think are best. So if I'm not willing to say that this should be like the law, that you have to back the money by gold or silver, what I am in favor of, however, is getting rid of all of these uh, laws that require you to accept a certain money. In other words, what do they call it? The... uh, um, um, this famous, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank anyway, it's uh, it, the, the laws that require you to accept U.S. dollars in the payment of uh, debts. It's, uh, it has a special name for it. Take that out. Legal tender laws. Legal tender laws, thank you. Of course, a simple thing like that. Yeah, that, that's the problem right there. Forcing people to accept fraudulent money is the problem. It's not the fraudulent money, because if you're free to reject it, it goes away. It's a problem only when you have to accept it or go to prison. So if all the legal tender laws were eliminated, the government could issue all of its phony bills that wanted to, but nobody would want to use them, or very few people, or that the discount would be so high that they would soon fall into uh, unpopularity and then not be used at all. As long as we have freedom of choice in money, like everything else, Freedom of speech, how about freedom of money? Let's be you know, consistent. As long as we have freedom to choose, I believe that over time, uh, the free market will determine which is the best money, and that's the one that people will, will use. Couldn't and agree more. Not because more. they're forced to, but because they want to. I couldn't agree more. You're a fascinating man, Edward. I've kept you a long time. I'm going to ask you two last questions. Um, the one being, in your opinion, What's the most important issue people should be paying attention to right now that isn't getting enough coverage? You have to excuse me. I have to pick my dog up because it's thundering here, and she will literally start barking if I don't pick her up. Every time it thunders, she gets a little scared. Oh, so okay. this is Isla, and Isla doesn't like thunder, and it's thundering here in South Florida. So uh, in any case, what what are people not paying attention to right now that they should be paying attention to that isn't getting enough coverage? Oh, wow. That's a big, long list. Uh, Let's see what's at the top of the list. At least at this moment, I think the very issues we're talking about are it. The monetary system is because we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. We get sort of bored with it. It's still the number one issue because the money is is the glue that holds everything together. If you want to retain the services or a a product of somebody else, you have to use money to get it, unless it's coercion, just plain physical force. So if they can, if they can take away from us our money or our ability to freely exchange our money, they will control us in every other way. As long as we have the option of having money of our own that we can use or not use, regardless of of the dictates of some ruling elite, we could go to our neighbors or go to our grocery store or go to our gas station and say, here's here's my uh, my tenth an ounce of 0.99 gold or silver or something like that. And would you fill up the tank of my gas? And so are you holding up? (laughs) As long as we're free to do that. And, and, and there's not a law that th- throws us in prison because we're doing it. 
then I think we have a chance of recovering all the rest of it. But if we lose our ability to even buy a loaf of bread to eat, we're through. And so I think the economic question and the focus on money and the monetary system is, yes, the number one issue of our day. Well, you know, we do have 10 states, 11 states now that have approved legal tender laws that say these one tenth ounce gold eagles can be used as legal tender. To your point, you can't make someone take it. But if they want to, mm -hmm. you can. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one last question for you, Edward, and, and uh, you know, an area of my area, I guess you could say that I've focused on for the last several years has been the rise of the BRICS countries. Do you think that this current system will be challenged? Do you think that the dollar, because of the weaponization of the treasury market, because of the mismanagement of our monetary policy, the creation of $100,000 of debt per second, every second, 24 seven, and a trillion dollars of debt roughly every three months, keeping in mind that a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago, is the mismanagement of the system since 1913, um, is that leading us down a path where we will lose the privilege of being the world reserve? Do you think that we are on the, the cusp of crossing over that line where we don't get it back and we've, 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 we've squandered this lovely opportunity that we've been given so much so that the rest of the world will move in a different direction? That'd be the last question I have for you today because it's something that I think about all the time. I'd love to hear your take. Well, I think the, the answer to that is pretty simple. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, the, there's some more to it. And that is that, well, is there anything that can be done about it? And if so, it can it really be done or just ameliorated in some way? Um, that's where we're headed. And that's where the, the powers that be, if I can use that ex expression, that's where they want it to head. They've been working on it for a long, long time. And they see all these crises that we're facing today, and health crises and uh, terrorist crises, and, and maybe we're going to have an invasion from outer space. Maybe we're going to have an electromagnetic pulse. You know, maybe we're going to have a failure in the water system. Maybe the food supply will dry up and, or, or uh, the trucks will not have gasoline, so people will be starving and eating each other. I mean, these things are all encouraged, if not, if not engineered by the powers that be, because when people are in panic mode, in absolute survival mode, they're not interested in little spicy questions like, well, is it in the Constitution? You know, all they want to know is, where's my bread? Where's my water? Where's my protection? How can I live? So, uh, no, that's, that's the background. We have to realize that this is what is going on. The powers that be are engineering crises and have been for that purpose for a long, long time. That's really the primary purpose of war, is to condition people into accepting radical changes in their lives and in their system without too much concern about legality or constitutionality. They're just concerned about survival and getting back to the good old days again. Um, so that's the, that's the real issue there. And uh, uh, can we ever get back? I mean, whether or not the U.S. dollar is the, is the reserve currency is not particularly, it's not even very high on that, on that list of uh, issues that I just mentioned, because it'll be, it can be equally bad either way, or we can, we can survive it either way. Well, we can't survive it. As long as it's the reserve currency, that means, that means since everybody knows that the currency is not backed by anything except military might of the United States government, that means that as long as the reserve currency lasts, we, the United States must still have that dominance. Once they're convinced that <clears throat> they can back away from our monetary system without being labeled as a terrorist uh, country or harboring terrorism or, or their leadership is a dictator, a terrible person, and they're doing bad things. And therefore, look out, here comes the U.S. Army and, and the U.S. Air Force and the drones and the missiles and everything else. When that, when that threat is gone, then the United States is will in trouble. be... 
ended. And uh, so that's a dilemma, isn't it? We don't want to see that happen. We don't want to see the, our own our own independence. I mean, there might be countries like China or others that decide, well, they got a lot of soldiers. They don't care if they lose a few million of them in an invasion. They'll just come in and take our stuff because we're in total chaos. You know, we don't want that. We got to have God forbid. Military. And you know, when you talk about these groups, the BRICS nations already have a larger swath of human population, three of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet, the majority of all of the the land and sea routes, the the, the majority of all of the commodities, both soft and hard, the, the production and the refining of the rare earths. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's very compelling. And, um, you know, I, I it's something that I think about all the time. And and hearing it through, through your perspective is, is fascinating, as is talking to you. I can't think of someone I'd rather sit down with a glass of wine and 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 pick your brain for an extended period of time. I've already kept you for an hour. I want to tell you how much uh, it means to me uh, that you uh, agreed to come on. I'd love to to chat with you again down the road. How can people find more information about you other than the books that you've written and the information that's already out there? Where's the best place for people to keep up on on what you're thinking these days? Well, we have a free uh, news service. It, uh, it's, it's called needtoknow.news. So if you just go to needtoknow.news... I'll it, put a link to that in the bottom yeah. of this as well. And uh, we, we publish uh, a new newsletter three times a week. And uh, we try to pick those items in the news that have real significance to the big issues, not just little things that are interesting. We, there is no sports in there. There's nothing about how to cook... Uh, a turkey on a, on a on a spit or anything like that. Uh, we have no social section, and much much of the news we ignore too because it's trivial stuff. But what we do focus on are the big issues that either are obviously big issues like war in the Middle East if it spreads to the to the world that's a big issue. But little issues as well as to you know what's going on in terms of the the abandonment of uh, legal rights for property and, and what's behind the scenes. And we try in just as few words as possible to summarize each story. So it's maybe maybe 150 word summary where you can get the meat of the whole story without having to read uh, the whole thing. Because we know that people have, you know, they have lives to live. They can't read all these stories from end to end. But so they can pick the ones they want to and then they can go to the full length stuff and read it there. And so it, we put a lot of work into condensing and and uh, focusing on what's the meaning behind the news, not just the, the storyline itself. So that's need to know news. And then for for those in your listening audience who have a crusader gene like we do and want to do something about this. Now, those are the people I'm really interested in, too. And I would say the place to start there is to come to redpilluniversity.org. I'll put a link to that in there as well, uh -huh. redpilluniversity.org. Uh-huh. And then the sister or, or the, yeah, the sister organization is redpillexpo.org. And that's an event. And we have two of those a year. And the next one is coming up in November, November um, 16 and 17. Where's that at? In Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, if you need someone else, count me in. I'd love to take part in that. I can't think of anything better to uh, to dedicate my time to. So you can sign me up if there's room. If not, I'll come and watch. Well, there's room. <laughs> well, count yeah. me in. I will uh, send an email to you. We can talk about that, too, because yeah. this stuff is all very, very much a passion of mine. And uh, yeah. I... I've been always about information. It's not about buying gold and silver to become wealthy. It's it's buying gold and silver because it is wealth, has been wealth for 5,000 years. And the things that you've talked about, the things that you've witnessed, the things that you see happening, and the things that you're continuing to talk about, to me, are, are what is so very, very important. So just to be mentioned in the same sentence as you and, and your endeavors is something that I hold near and dear and, and um, would look forward to... Uh, having another conversation with you uh, in person and talking more about this. Oh, well, let's do it then. That sounds great. Count me in. I'll send uh -huh. you an email. I, uh, again, want to thank you. I'm sorry for my my shaking dog here, but all of a sudden it is pouring out. You were speaking of Noah and the flood. It almost looks that way right <laughs> now. So I will let you run, Edward. It's been a true right. pleasure and a true honor. I do look forward to picking up where we left off, and uh, I will reach out to you 
offline here and about some information on the uh, Red Pill Expo. I can't think of anything I'd rather do. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking forward to that, Andy, and, and thanks for those good questions. And uh, I apologize to you and to your audience for uh, getting off track, but every Don't time I silly. think of something, I think of three other things that are maybe not on target. You know what? Someone target, who's been around the block like you have, we should all be thankful <laughs> that we can learn from you and listen to your stories. And uh, that's the best part of my job, always has been since day one. And uh, you just reaffirm that. So uh, God bless you for doing what you're doing, for contributing to this world and helping people see the truth. So uh, I look forward to eating one of those red pills in person and uh, <laughs> chatting with you again, picking right. up where we left off. Until the All meantime, right. uh, until then, I will look uh, very much forward to doing just that. And I uh, hope you and, and uh, everyone else out there has a great rest of your day and, and stays well. All right, thank you. Same to you. All the best to you, Edward. Thank you, sir. Little by Little with Andy Schechtman.